Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this all-star panel discussing how coronavirus and COVID-19 are affecting our communities uh, and our older populations across the world. The emergence of these diseases has highlighted the vulnerability of aging populations, while at the same time igniting a spirit of mutual support, engagement, resilience, innovation in communities uh, all around the world. However, our bias towards older people, more commonly known as ageism, um, has it blinded us to the vulnerability of other individuals with underlying conditions, including younger people, people poor people, and people of color. For example, in my home city of Washington, D.C., African Americans are twice as likely to contract the disease than their white counterparts, while Latinos are more than seven times more likely. In places like Northwestern Oregon, for example, the situation is far worse, with Latinos there now 20 times as likely than others to have the virus. There's certainly no arguing that COVID-19 is harder on older people, especially the extreme old and those living in nursing homes. Individuals over the age of 65 account for 80% of the U.S. deaths from the disease, according to the CDC. But as a result, um, but as a recent report from Bloomberg has noted, um, this is true of most illnesses. In 2018, 78% of all U.S. deaths were from internal causes. That is excluding accidents, murders, overdoses, and the like. So what makes this time in this disease different? In the modern in the modern era, diseases often influence the way we as humans live, changing everything from how we work and engage to how we produce and consume food, how we bathe in toilet, and how we design home and community. Could this be a seminal moment in human history where we fundamentally alter uh, the way we live, especially in a world with increased longevity and lower birth rates? Now, today we're not going to talk about what's happening with the older population and the progression of the panic. Seriously. We're explicitly not going to focus on the rates of infection or mortality. I think we've heard enough of that already on the news every day. Rather, um, I'd like us to focus on the good. We're going to focus on what's happening to innovate and serve older populations. We're going to examine high-tech and low-tech solutions that are keeping older people, especially those at risk for isolation, connected to their communities and to their families. We're going to talk about the elephant in the room, ageism, and we're going to talk about the one word that I keep hearing to describe older people, particularly those in the workplace during this pandemic, which is resilience. Speaking of resilience, and before we start this panel, I'd like to give special thanks to the resilient team at Longevity Leaders, who, forced, who were forced to cancel our in-person meeting in April due to the pandemic yet they found a way to innovate and bring us together virtually less than a month later. Um, Terry and Angela, uh, thank you for your leadership and your collaboration for nearly two years. Now on to the panel. We're joined by an all-star group today that includes Karen Etkin, founder of thegerontologist.com and co-founder and vice president of product at Clans. Um, you can find more about them at thegerontologist.com and clans.io. Sanjay Lobo, founder of OnHand. You can find them online at beonhand.co.uk. Susan Stiles, who's the Senior Director for Product Development and Strategy at the National Council on Aging, found online at ncoa.org. And Patrick Vernon, Associate Director for Connected Communities at the Center for Aging Better in the UK. That's agingbetter, with an E, .org.uk. Patrick, I'd like to start with you if that's okay. Um, are age-inclusive communities coming together during this pandemic? And if so, where are you seeing the best practices or cases in the United Kingdom? Uh, that's an interesting question uh, because um, I think with COVID-19, in many ways has brought communities together. And even though when the initial um, pandemic started in the UK, everyone was focused on everyone over 70. What's quite clear is that the, in the UK, the pandemic is affecting all ages from teenagers, people, and particularly the work that we do around midlife, which is 50 to 70, as well as people in care homes. So I think uh, in the early days, the, the kind of stereotypes, the ageism discrimination was quite clear and apparent in the media that 
you know, um, these older people, they're going to be a real burden, all the usual stereotypes. But now it's what's quite clear, everyone is affected by the pandemic and it's brought communities together. A classic example is the number of older people uh, actually volunteering who are not shielded, who are part of what is known as mutual aid um, support. That ranges at a basic level in local areas, local communities, around food banks, where people not only have donated to food banks, but are involved in what is known as food distribution. Um, of people have been engaging online and different ways to bring communities together. And I think in many ways, even in households where, because of social distancing policy, where if you've got a grandparent and a grandchild and then in different households, they've tried new ways to engage with each other. That's in my family. So my family, we're all, you know, we're all in different parts of the UK, but on a weekly basis through Zoom, all about three and a half generations of us, a bit like the Waltons, all come together and talk and share as, as well. So I think it's been, it's actually going to, I think as, as we move out this post-COVID situation bit by bit, I think it's going to really bring a real debate around this inter intergenerational conversation dialogue Whereas before in the UK is focused around property and wealth. So if you were a baby, baby boomer and you did quite well financially in terms of career and assets compared to the wise, the extra wise generation who missed out because of the high prices in wages, the high prices in property values and being not being able to buy a home, it's actually bringing everyone together on that level. But equally, we have to recognise that um, it is leading to different types of um, discrimination. So there was increase in hate crime, particularly against the Chinese community in, hate in the UK, because unfortunately the rhetoric that's been used that it's a Chinese disease, which it's not, it's a, it's a pandemic, it's a, it's a universal impact as well. And secondly, uh, as you mentioned in your opening piece, Bradley, it's actually disproportionately affecting certain communities. Uh, in the UK, it's having a massive impact on minority ethnic communities, ranging from um, Southeast Asian community from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, African communities, Black British uh, as well. So, and that's, and that's led to uh, the government in the UK uh, lead, um, commissioning a review to look at the impact of deaths. But I think in that conversation that has led to a debate around valuing diversity and recognition because, and people recognizing that the frontline workers who are doing the work in the NHS, uh, in social care, on transport systems are from minority ethnic communities and now people now realize that frontline workers are important uh, and I think that's quite important in, in that debate and conversation. Right certainly and I think those bring some interesting perspectives to the table Patrick thank you. Um, one of the things you mentioned was the importance of family um, but what happens if you don't have a family? Often older people are, are sometimes left behind, sometimes put to the side. Um, Susan and, and Sanjay, I'd like you to, to, to talk to this. Sanjay, maybe you can start. Um, with On Hand, obviously you're connecting volunteers to opportunities within the community. Are you seeing people take these up? Are they young people? Are they middle-aged people? Are they older people? Is there a greater demand for services amongst older people? And are they able to find you? Sure, um, thanks for the question, uh, Bradley. So um, we've always connected a younger demographic of volunteer with a, a slightly older person. And we typically um, help someone who's over 70. Um, and what we've seen um, since COVID started is um, a massive spike in volunteer numbers, which I think has been universal across most volunteering organizations. I think, I think we've seen that for the NHS app and, and various other places. Um, and the spike was dramatic. I mean, for us, we, we doubled the volume of, of volunteers signing up pretty much within a week. Um, and, um, and we were set up really to attract a younger demographic of volunteers. So we, we typically have a millennial, a 25 to 36 year old volunteer. And they, they've signed, signed up in their thousands to help um, with COVID and response in their local communities. It's been quite overwhelming and very much as, as has been reported in the, in the press. Um, so they've been able to find us. And in terms of um, putting opportunities out there, uh, essentially we work with uh, local authorities. They give us, um, essentially they send people to us who've called the local authority and need help. And we get that onto our app the same day. And we are finding the um, response time from volunteers has been um, I mean, off the charts. It's, it's same day or next day. 
the person that needs help is getting help, um, which is just um, wildly beyond where we were before, but also just, just wonderful to see from local communities. And it's, it's wonderful intergenerational help uh, that we're seeing from um, a very much younger demographic uh, through our app anyway. Um, and I, I guess a, a generation that's always had um, bad press, the millennials, um, they've, they've been absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing for us. Sandra, if I could ask a, a quick follow-up before going on to Susan. I, what types of services are, um, are most in need right now? Um, obviously here in the, the U.S., one of the challenges that we're seeing is is that immediate piece of combating isolation, but also combating hunger. Um, since older people uh, are almost at a double whammy here of having to stay inside, restricted access to the food stores and the grocery stores, uh, and some uh, who were working in their 70s and some, sometimes their 80s can no longer work for fear of um, contracting the disease. What services are you seeing in most demand uh, in the UK today? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, really. It's, it's, so it, it is shopping. And um, in the old world, we used to do shop trips for a lot of people. Um, typically, we'd go in, put the shopping in the fridge, check for out-of-date food, put that in the bin and take the bin out. Obviously, we're not doing that anymore. We're doing shop drops, leaving it on the, the doorstep. Um, so it's shop drops, it's medical pickups from chemists, and uh, we do a lot of uh, basic errands as well, uh, so running things to a, a post office. Um, and we've seen some local authorities um, just really basic check-ins. So where a social service team has lost contact with someone who's vulnerable, um, the so so social service team, they're at home, right? They're all homebound. So that we can access a local volunteer who just can go, go down the street and knock on a door just to see if that person's okay. We're seeing a lot of that as well. And Susan, I, I, I certainly understand uh, um, the work that NCOA does. And so maybe you can give a little bit, bit of background for folks, that, folks at home who are listening to this, um, especially your direct outreach uh, to communities um, serving both adult day centers, senior centers. How is technology really transforming the way you connect with this vulnerable population? Well, technology is transforming really just every aspect of how we connect with them. Um, we have been engaged with um, technology for years, you know, for over 20 years, many of our support tools to help people get access to benefits have been online. So this isn't necessarily something new, but with the crisis, we've had to really port so many of our services that before were more in the high touch realm into the high tech realm or even a low tech um, call. So, so really what our, our, our senior centers, we operate the um, National Institute of Senior Centers, which is a consortium of 1,100 senior centers across the country um, that works in concert with another about 10,000 senior centers. So it's, it's quite a wide group. It's, it's, a, it's a large network. Um, but much of the work in the past has been, you know, more high touch, delivering meals, um, having congregate meals, having classes, doing, you know, everything that is really in community. So um, being able to port a lot of these services online has been, has been easy in the places where there is good broadband service and where their constituents have access to broadband, to technology, to in-home Wi-Fi, but really painful in areas where it's just a technology desert, you know, for so many people. And it's a technology desert, not just for the individuals or the older adults, but it can be a technology desert for the service organization. So we have, um, we're hearing about a lot of staff at, at our senior centers who are trying to work remotely, but don't have good connectivity. They don't have updated um, technology. So it's, it's really been a struggle. They're doing a lot over the phone um, and they're doing, you know, where they can, where, where they have technology, they have ported classes, um, group chat, mental health check-ins, um, any, any kind of um, sort of, um, you know, dance classes, cooking demonstrations, you know, anything that they can do online, they're doing online. But there's a real, um, there's, there's a lot of inequity out there. 
And so those that can are, but those who can't are piecing together their services via via sort of in-home visits that aren't quite in-home, that are, you know, at a distance or telephone calls. And, you know, I'm really encouraged by what I hear from Sanjay and Patrick about what's going on in England, because we're seeing almost the polar opposite here. Our senior centers are reporting a 92% drop off in their volunteers because they rely so much on older adults as that volunteer mechanism. So thinking to the future about a model where it's more of an intergenerational volunteer um, approach, I think is one that a lot of organizations in this country should really take into consideration and to look to your organizations, you know, for insights into how that is done. Right. I appreciate that point of view. And I think that 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 pivots us nicely to to Karen's expertise. Uh, if you haven't seen what Karen's done at the gerontologist, uh, geron technologist, I should say, um, Thank you. around the, the the map of the industry, it's really quite fascinating work. But Karen, obviously, in these times where we face mass disruption, um, we see some organizations step forward, some organizations step back. There are some things government can do. There's some things that are better suited for the private sector uh, and some things better developed for the the nonprofit sector. Um, Of your industry map, where are you seeing um, the sectors that are are adapting fastest uh, to the change that's happening now? And I won't put you on the spot to, to answer which companies, um, but if you, if you would get maybe a little specific in the type of work they're doing and how they're being taken up uh, and by perhaps which income class, I think that would be very interesting for those listening today. Sure. Uh, so obviously technology companies and especially startup companies uh, tend to adapt um, Easy, more easily and uh, rapidly to change. So there are several companies, several HD companies uh, on the market map that were uniquely positioned to deal with this pandemic because they've been developing um, tech-enabled products and services for the aging population for several years, um, like, like Sanjay's company. Um, and those specific companies, like Sanjay's company or like uh, Intuition Robotics or... Um, Papa, they already had a product that could serve uh, the older population very well during this pandemic. So some of them never had to uh, adapt their products at all. Some of them created new features uh, specifically for this pandemic. Uh, For example, uh, I know that Care Predict um, created a feature for contact tracing because their wearables are able to uh, let assisted living facilities know which people came into contact with one another. And so if someone uh, is uh, diagnosed with the virus, they are able to very fastly track who that person came into contact with and isolate them to stop uh, further spread of the virus. Um, that being said, exactly like Susan said, you have to have the technology infrastructure in place in order to use uh, these very advanced technologies. So obviously, um, seniors who are lower income, they will probably not have a broadband, they will probably not have laptops and tablets and smartphones. And that makes it very, very challenging to deploy uh, technologies in areas that are either rural uh, or lower income. Um, And seniors who are who live in the cities in urban areas and and have um, higher income and are, have already had infrastructure installed in their homes. They've already learned how to use laptops, tablets, smartphones, smart speakers, wearables prior to this pandemic are better positioned to not only uh, weather the storm, but perhaps also uh, prosper and um, start doing more things uh, online at home, like exercise, like learning, uh, like getting their groceries delivered. Um, we know that a lot of, a lot of seniors uh, did enjoy going outside, 
to, to getting their groceries because of the social element that, that uh, these types of errands have. Um, but maybe they didn't really enjoy the part of carrying these groceries up, this, up uh, one or two flights of stairs. Uh, and now they have Sanjay's volunteers delivering the groceries to their doorstep, which is amazing. It's, and it's a habit that they will probably uh, keep with them even after the pandemic is over. And, and I guess I, as a follow-up question to you, Karen, of these companies that are doing really well, are any of them employing an intergenerational workforce? How do they know what older people need, especially those that are, are vulnerable? That is an excellent question. Um, I don't know about all of these companies, uh, but I do know that for the companies that I worked at, uh, for example, Intuition Robotics, um, they hired me as their first employee because I'm a gerontologist. And so my role at the company uh, at the very beginning was to make sure that we are uh, getting older adults involved in the design process of the product. So products like LEQ were designed not only for older adults, but also with older adults uh, in every step of the development program and the development phase. And I'm sure Sanjay has done the same in his company. And it's something that I think more and more tech companies, um, especially in this field, are aware that they need to do. Uh, because most employees in tech companies are young, and like you said, they don't necessarily know what it's like to be an older adult um, because if they haven't lived through that experience. Uh, so they are aware that they need to have, um, to basically include older adults in the design process. And there are uh, some programs that enable, enable um, companies to do that, either uh, in-house or externally. But I think we're in 2020, we're in a much better place than we were 10 years ago for sure. Uh, in that aspect. Right. Uh, Patrick, I'd like to go back to the question briefly on, on um, both the income divide as well as the technology divide. I was wondering if you might be able to address that from a UK perspective. Um, where are the hiccups and where are you seeing either private industry or the community at large, including government, step in to, to smooth things over? Uh, for the foreseeable future, because it looks like we're going to be at this for quite a long time. Yeah, funny you mention that. There's always been, over the last 10, 15 years, uh, a number of strategies done by government trying to address the issue around digital exclusion. Because what's quite, quite clear around the pandemic in the UK is if you live in the area of, of good quality broadband, and, been, and actually a number of the broadband providers have to relax some of their tariffs recognising the bit they're playing in this pandemic. But if you haven't got the latest technology, uh, smartphones, laptops, and a number of the mutual aid projects have actually been trying to get laptops and deliver those to older people because that, so they can at least have access to online as well. But what's quite clear in Britain, there's a real class divide, a social class divide, which is reflected in tech. So uh, even though the majority of people in the UK, there's a high proportion of people with mobile phones, not everyone's got the latest apps or know how to even use them as well. And definitely what's quite clear if you compare to urban areas, inner city areas, parts of London, Birmingham, Manchester, and then you compare that to rural areas, there is, if you've got a very good broadband connection, then you're more likely to be connected compared. And that's always been a big issue over the years around to have that connectivity particularly in, uh, um, in rural areas of the country, uh, because um, that's the first thing. The second thing linked to the kind of access is about languages. Um, so we're, you know, um, not, uh, not all stuff is um, done in the whole variety of community languages. In London, there are over 300 community languages. Uh, and not to say that you have to have everything, all apps and everything in community languages, but for certain communities who don't have English as their first language, um, that becomes a challenge around access and technology, uh, and even and, and probably what's interesting probably people are probably referring to apps and websites from different parts of the world to get uh, uh, information is. Um, the third issue is around social distancing policy. So in the UK, we've got a clear policy around social distancing. If you are um, over 70, you are class as shielded, especially if you've got underlying health conditions, uh, which means that you have to be in self-isolation for, for the minimum of three months. There's talk that might that might even extend longer, despite the fact that we might 
eased the, the um, lockdown. And uh, I know people who are shielded, who uh, are really dependent on technology. And if they're not dependent on technology, then they're relying on a friend to deliver deliveries for them using low tech, i.e. the phone, etc. But what's quite clear, as, again, is the, is the lack of investment in technology in the UK. Um, and there's been a disinvestment generally in public services in accessing technology. Um, it is, it's, it's actually forced local authorities and many NHS and public sector bodies in literally in weeks to do the things which they've been planning to do for 10, 15 years around tech and, and doing stuff online. They've been forced to do that within three weeks. I mean, I'm in regular contact with a number of local authorities who have had to literally do stuff overnight. I'm sure Sanjay can pick up and mention that too. Um, but that has meant that if you are tech savvy, you are with the flow, you, you can get with the program. And it means that people are being left behind. That, that includes uh, workers, co-workers, uh, as well as people in the community as well. I think as we move on to this situation, it requires a significant investment in bringing the skills of people in a 21st century and you know, new technology, and for technology companies to try and think of engaging ways to engage with the public as well. Right, Susan, could you, would you mind talking to this a bit as well? I'm, 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 I'm curious as, as your perspective, because it seems that there are some, some lines of division between the UK and the US approach. Um, where, where, where are the big holes that need to be filled uh, now and in the future? Well, in, in, in some way, there are some similarities in that, you know, I think the rural versus the urban divide is, is pretty um, stand, acute, you know, in the U.S., but there are also a lot of pockets, you know, in urban areas where there is a big uh, digital divide. And we're, uh, we're seeing that now, um, especially when it comes, you know, so many of our schools have had to go online, and there are students across the even in the county that I live in, which is um, just outside of Washington, D.C., where many um, families don't have access to the Internet and they don't have the technology. So even in areas where you would expect that there would be, um, you know, good availability and good service, there isn't always that availability and service. And... Um, you know, I think the, the lack of investment is, and the, maybe it's a, a I think there's a, a little bit of a lack of um, imagination too on the part of some of our technology companies and also our policymakers to really understand how, how just central to our lives um, broadband and access to technology is. And maybe that is one good thing that will come out of this crisis is that the the intersection between you know really just everything that we do um including you know you know getting groceries delivered easily doing online banking being a part of the world being connected to one another there that fabric of technology is is essential and when people are on the other side of that of that fabric or can't be a part of that, then they're isolated even further. Um, I think on the plus side, there is uh, there's movement now in the US, in the, um, in the government to finally really take this on in a really big and monumental way. So there, there is a proposal right now that is kind of making its way through um, our government that, that addresses infrastructure, it addresses um, technology adoption, and it also addresses affordability and, and, and maybe can help take us to that next level. And then across the country, I mean, we're hearing of wonderful stories of um, people, communities sending, setting up lending libraries for different technology devices, um, public-private partnerships. I think um, T-Mobile just it put out 10,000 iPads into the New York City um, public housing system um, that are all internet-enabled. So that, that issue, you know, it's not just the technology, it's also the 
you know, the, the access that's important there. And those devices um, are being, we're, they're coupling that release of the devices with an education um, experience so that people then know how to use them and are using them to the, you know, in, in the best ways, in the ways that are important to them. So I, I think there are some, you know, some good stories. And I think that there are um, people in, in the government who are seeing this as, as a real watershed moment. Like, okay, this can maybe take us to that next step. Um, much as, um, you know, during the Great Depression, we got over that hump of really providing electricity to all um, Americans. And, you know, maybe this will be that moment when we really see broadband and technology as, you know, not just a nice to have, but a need to have for people to really live lives to the fullest, access medical care, you know, and, and other basic services. Right. I, I completely appreciate it and, and, and uh, agree with that position. Uh, I spoke recently with the leaders of both the nursing home industry as well as the home care industry in the U.S., uh, and they, they have said almost universally that this will leapfrog us forward in the next six months, what may have taken up to 60 years to do. Um, I'm interested in the, the, the now um, because I think we, we have a picture of the next, and I think that might be a good place for us to finish. But for the now, uh, Sanjay and Karen in particular, I wondered if you might be able to share what are you doing or what companies do you know that are doing uh, right now to get people uptecked very quickly so that they stay connected to their communities? Sanjay, can we start with you? Yeah, sure. So, um so you're kind of right. So we're very much focused on the now and the reality that we have. A lot of people we're helping who may not get online anytime soon. And so COVID's forced us to address a couple of things about our model that we weren't, um, we weren't comfortable with in the past. So could we get rural? And could we, um, could we make it really affordable for people? So both, both of the debates you're having there about affordability and can we get to the really isolated folks? Um, the reality is we used to charge um, people that needed help for access to the service in the past. And that immediately felt wrong, immediately felt wrong as COVID hit. Um, and we were able to partner with local authorities who, who brought us in as a, an alternative to what they can provide locally, um, essentially making it free. So uh, immediately addressing affordability, affordability gap. So it, it was made free in uh, various London boroughs, which was just fantastic. Um, and that, that addressed one of the problems for us. Um, and by the way, we, we don't expect the people we help to be online. Um, they can call us. So we, we have a, a call center effectively that uh, takes, takes, takes requests and then we put it on the app for the um, uh, volunteers to use the app-based stuff. Um, but uh, hopefully COVID has helped us, uh, again, leapfrog where we would, 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 what would have taken us years to get local authorities engaged in how you uh, make the service really affordable. Um, and the second thing was getting how, how, do, how do you get rural? Um, and in the UK, we've, we've, we're in talks with um, a banking organization that is focused on rural areas. It has branches and it's actively opening branches in rural areas, um, which is kind of different, um, kind of different. But um, what they're talking to us about is can they use their employees who are in those branches as the volunteers using our app and therefore getting to more rural locations? Now, that's not foolproof. It's, it's certainly not foolproof across the UK. But in certain areas, we're going to get much further and deeper out of cities um, than we ever thought was possible. And, and again, neither the affordability or the ability to get out of cities uh, was something on our radar pre-COVID. So in the here and now, we're, we're addressing some of it, probably not all of it. And as a follow on point, maybe we'll come back to later, which is around how you, um, how you garner this civil, um, civil capital uh, and how society has really um, risen to the challenge of volunteering. And how you capitalize that on that for the future and could local authorities and government take advantage of that to do more for people uh, at a certain stage in life and actually for a much much lower cost than they're doing today and karen um, yeah so as i mentioned the intuition robotics uh, recently very recently because of COVID, decided to expand their um, insiders program nationally in all of the us 
and provide LEQs uh, for seniors in need for free, uh, basically to help them communicate with their family members because we know that a lot of seniors uh, haven't had the chance to learn how to uh, master uh, digital tools prior to that. So LEQ can basically bridge that digital divide and help them do that. And also uh, Uniper, which is, happens to be another Israeli company, they have a technology that it can turn any TV into a smart TV and allow seniors not only to communicate with uh, their family and consume uh, digital content, but also consume telehealth services. Uh, so those are just, uh, just two examples that come to mind. I know there's been a lot of, a lot of companies uh, that developed uh, not only specific offerings for COVID, but also decided to either um, give their services at a discount or for free. So, I think we can be very, very proud of uh, the tech community and what everyone's been doing to, to help seniors throughout this pandemic. Right, and in our, in our final moments of the panel today, I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to uh, perhaps take out your crystal ball, um, offer a bit of criticism to the past and, and maybe a vision of the future. Um, and if each of you could take just a moment to, to answer this question, what is the one thing um, that our communities will keep or return to going forward? And what is the one thing that our communities will have to change in the age of COVID and going forward? Um, Susan, could we start with you? Um, yeah. The, um, I, the one thing that I think that we will keep is maybe the, um, the, the same thing that we'll, you know, kind of leave behind in, in, a, in a sense. I, I think that we will continue to see community-based programs offering more services online. They have very quickly made the move online and are doing that. They're enrolling people for benefits. They are... Um, you know, offering classes, they're, they're, doing, they're doing almost everything online. And what we're hearing is that now that um, many of their constituents are, uh, understand how, how this can be a seamless part of their lives and an important part of their lives to engage online and, and maybe to do some basic um, services online, they don't want to go back. So they're fully anticipating that many of their um, senior center members will really demand to continue to have online services of, of varying stripes. So they, they will you know, want some in-person programming, sure, because that, that is important and, and that in-person connection is important, but they are looking forward to a, an increased demand for online services and online programs and in fact, um, many have seen an uptick in their membership since COVID-19 because more people are coming online who would not before have gone into a senior center or maybe wanted to say, I'm ready to go to a senior center. But now that they see what types of classes that they offer, they are, they're more willing to do it. So I think that the, the mindset that will have to be left behind is that older adults don't want to participate in an online world. They do. <laughs> They're like all of us. This, this is one aspect of our engagement with the world, not the only aspect, but one aspect of it. So I think we have to leave behind that mindset and, and have this new mindset of offering a hybrid of products and services and programs online. Patrick, what are your thoughts? Everyone talks about the new normal uh, and the pandemic, definitely in the UK context and maybe other parts of the world, including America, has shown it's been a, a spotlight on the current glaring inequalities in society. So if technology can play a role in breaking down those digital social exclusion divides, which is ironically we've been forced to do so because people need medical medical attention people need food in context sometimes in shelter in terms of fun accommodation and if we could take that, that that the innovation of technology to tackle issues around discrimination to tackle issues around social exclusion 
and and the, and the debate around making uh, a new perspective on social isolation, I think that'd be really fantastic if we could have that brave, the, the ingenuity and, and, the, and the enthusiasm and, and the urgency for action, if we can continue that, that would be positive, that would be really great. If we go back to the old normal of, let's see what happens, we're not quite sure, there's no innovation, there's no risk taking, then it'll be, well, we haven't learned anything at all around this pandemic. Karen? Yeah, I completely agree with, with Susan. And I think the cat's out of the bag in, in digital services and online classes. And once everyone realized that this is a possibility, it's definitely going to stay with, with us, which is amazing for not only for, for seniors, but just for people with disabilities and for people in rural areas who didn't have access to, to physical community centers uh, in their close vicinity. Uh, what we have to leave behind um, I think we definitely have to live behind uh, ageism. I think ageism has been something that um, has been um, an issue during this pandemic. Um, we've seen conversations on, on social networks, um, singling out uh, seniors because they're more, more vulnerable to the pandemic. And I think we'll have to uh, definitely, definitely leave that behind if we want our society to be in a better place after the pandemic, uh, better than it was before. And Patrick, or Sanjay, rather, sorry, Sanjay. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Uh, so uh, the things I, I think uh, that really, I really hope remain with us, um, it's the rise of civil society. So certainly in the UK, we've seen this just astronomical rise of people that want to volunteer and give their time to help in the crisis. And we, we saw it overnight with our NHS launched an app for volunteers and almost a million people signed up overnight. So just, just incredible numbers. Um, and if we lost that, that would be, that would be a huge, a huge miss by the UK. Um, so just the economic value of having that, that, that help and the real um, help that those, those, those volunteers could give throughout our community is, is giant. And it's been talked about a lot in the media. It's been talked about by the Bank of England. Um, there's something, um, significance in that social capital and I really I really hope that that survives um, in terms of things to leave behind um, I, I, I probably pick the intergenerational one so yeah we play a very small part in connecting uh, generations but again coming back to the rise of volunteers it's, it's every generation that has wanted to volunteer and um, I, I don't think we've seen that in the past or, or not on mass we've, we've never seen the younger generations uh, helping older generations en masse, um, I think this, there's an opportunity here to, to just, just solve that. And hopefully that helps with a number of other comments, especially ageism. Well, on that, I, I, I certainly agree. The perspectives have been uh, phenomenal. And I, I certainly think we're entering a, a brave new world of sorts as it relates to uh, serving older populations, but also um, just making our world a little bit more inclusive. Um, I want to make sure to thank each and every one of you, Karen, Susan, Sanjay, and Patrick, um, um, for the team at Longevity Leaders for pulling us together today from Israel to the United Kingdom to the Eastern United States. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you all today, and I thank you for um, taking the time and spending it with us. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Thank you.